It's now 4.30 and I'd like to call to order this uh, March 6th meeting of the Monroe County Community Justice Response Committee. We'll start with our uh, guide. Oh, wait, let's start with our roll call. Ms. Mosier. Commissioner Givens. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Commissioner Thomas. Yep. Councillor Iverson. Councillor Crossley. Here. Councillor Wiltz. Judge Fawcett. Here. Judge Stafford. Here and with regrets from Judge Crothy as she is under the weather today. Sheriff Marte. Here. From the prosecutor's office, April Wilson. Here. From the public defender's office, Michael Hunt. Here. And I will note for the record that Commissioner Jones has just arrived as well. Oh, and Councillor Iverson. Yes, thank you. We have chair. Uh, do you under Councillor Iverson, will you read the guiding principles, please? It would be my pleasure, and before I do so, I want to s just indicate that Councilmember Wiltz is uh, unable to join us because she's driving home from a family funeral, so our thoughts and condolences are with her and her family. Our guiding principles are as follows. Recognizing our commitment to public safety, we will work collaboratively and transparently to first Prioritize treatment over incarceration when appropriate. Second, build a justice facility that meets constitutional standards and treats inmates with dignity. Third, address inequities in race, economic status, disability, national origin, sexual orientation, and gender. And fourth, reduce the number of people entering the criminal justice system and reduce recidivism for those who are or were in the system. I'd just like to give one or two updates. Uh, the results of the RFQ review will be presented to the Board of Commissioners this Wednesday, March the 6th at our work session. And then at the commissioner's regular meeting on March 22nd, we expect to vote on whether or not to accept the recommendation of the RFQ group. And assuming all goes well, the company which we settle on will be invited to do a presentation to the JCR, CJRC on April 3rd and the submissions for the RFQ are now posted on the CJRC website for anybody that wants to, to review them. Um, we're gonna be sharing a mic tonight because it turned out that uh, Ms. Mosier needs one so she can also be heard on CATS, so we're gonna be sharing tonight. Yeah, that's for public comment, so we wanna make sure. Yeah, um, and we plan to end promptly at six tonight, um, so I wanna get started. So. Uh, do you have the list of people who wish to speak via public comment? Thank you, Ms. Moser. Um, first up tonight will be, is it Nicole Seeger? Hope I'm reading that correctly. Please come up to the mic if, and pronounce your name correctly if I've mispronounced <laughs> it. <laughs> I have it all in here. Thank you so much. Thank you, CRJC. My name is Nicole Siegel. I'm a member of Care Not Cages, among other things. Um, and I am um, ha happy again to be following your progress. Um, I'm very concerned about the possibility that the um, path you are taking now towards working in small groups will prevent the public from being able to participate in and comment on the work you are doing. Uh, and I hope that if you do take that route, that you will publicize the meeting times, that you will allow people to be present uh, and, I, uh, I th and to have public comment. Um, and I also think that you must have the groups report back to the whole regularly. So you, you still, I think, will need to have meetings of this body as a whole. Uh, otherwise, the groups will carry out a function to its end um, without figuring out whether it's the right function to carry out for the group. So. Um, you know, my hope is that instead of doing anything towards building a new jail, you will have groups that are also focused on figuring out how the jail could be um, made livable, uh, constitutional, 
and acceptable um, by shrinking the population by looking at the ways that the reasons people are in there can be addressed more directly. And the thing that I'm most interested in understanding is whether the administrative hold for other counties has to do with a um, fee-for-service situation. Are we taking people from other counties because the other counties pay us? Or are we doing that for, um, for a, a, a reason that has to do with something specific and unavoidable? It seems that it would be a very poor choice to build a new jail because we are housing people from other counties. Uh, so, and that has been, at times in some years, the greatest reason for incarceration in the Monroe County Jail. So I, I would like that uh, addressed. Among the top ones, Sheriff Marte is shaking his head. But in, in 2020 and 2021, those were the figures. So <laughs> thank you for uh, your attention. And I look forward to learning more if I'm wrong. Thank you, Ms. Siegel. Uh, next up would be Justin Huerta. And again, I apologize for mispronouncing anyone's name. Can you put your hand on the list you might get from leadership for the recorder and then get back to us? We have uh, someone online with their hand raised. OK. Oh, Please pronounce your name since I may have mispronounced it. <laughs> My name is Justin Huerta, and I'm the director of Focus Initiatives. Yeah, Focus Initiatives, the prison reentry program. And everybody has to excuse me, I just walked three flights of stairs. <laughs> but, uh, okay. All I really had to say was uh, I am one of the people that is directly affected by building new jails. I did 15 years in prison altogether, off and on on the life installment plan, four years here, three years there, all for minor drug charges, nonviolent possessions, and a dealing. Uh, most drugs I've ever been caught with in my whole life is 10 grams, okay? Never once did the state say, maybe we should give this guy some type of drug treatment. The first answer was, we gotta put him in prison. He got caught with this three grams, four grams of drugs, cocaine. We have to put him in prison. I did all that time there. Once I went to prison, it was different levels of trauma and brutality that I was exposed to on several different levels. I have seen what this ha happens firsthand. In 2020, I was released, and I'm not gonna be long-winded. In 2020, I was released, and uh, I just, I said, I'm never going back. I don't know how to make it out here, so I'm just gonna go to work, and I'm gonna come home. I'm gonna hide from the world. I'm not coming out. I did that for a few months until I met the people at Focus Initiatives who were referred to me and reached out to me. And they began to show me levels of compassion and show me levels of, of care. And it really affected me because I didn't know these people. And they really showed me some level of, of human interaction from people who said, hey, you're a valuable human being. Once I was constantly reinforced with this message, different things began to happen for me different things begin to happen in my life. And now, three years later, which is like one of the longest times I've ever been released in the past 25 years. Three years later, I'm here, I'm doing strong, I don't have any desire to go back in any direction. And I'm only more determined and more focused than ever to go forward and continue to pass on the things that I have learned. I just wanted my voice to be heard here, and I know it represents a lot of different people, that locking people up is not <laughs> the answer. It only compounds and multiplies trauma. Trauma happens in prison. I know, can't nobody tell me anything different. I know, I've lived there. 
once that trauma takes place, those mindsets are reinforced and, and founded in concrete. It, it, it becomes extremely difficult for a reversal to take place. I'm excited about SB1 bill, mental health services. Mm -hmm. That's what's needed. Yeah. It's obvious at this point. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> That's what's needed. If we can take just fractions of those huge, enormous sums being spent on putting people in holes and putting people, locking them away from the sun and locking them away from the people who love and care about them the most. If we can come together as a community and show these people who need help that we care about them, I guarantee you that recidivism rates will have no choice but to be reduced because I have abolished it in my own life with the help of people who show care and compassion. And I really want to thank this board for just letting me speak that and get that out. And I hope everybody takes that little nugget home and ponders it for a while. Congratulations on yeah. what thank you're you. doing. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you, <laughs> thank you very you. much. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'll remind the audience that we are trying to keep public comment to three minutes a person, and it does show up on the screen. Uh, but those were important words to hear. Uh, next up, uh, Sam Dixon. Yes. I did not. Uh, you you are next on the list after this, and we rely on we are relying we are relying on Miss Mosier to tell us who. Uh, has spoken recently, if that's incorrect, I apologize. But you will get your turn, for sure. Hi there. Uh, my name is Sam. I'm a local worker here in Bloomington and voter here. And the only reason I learned about the new jail proposal was thanks to the reporting of Dave Askins at the B Square Beacon. So I wanna appreciate reporters covering issues like this first and foremost, otherwise I would not have known. I would say the city and county have some work to do in making the process transparent and open. Furthermore, I think the proposal is a terrible one. Um, I keep hearing new jail, new jail as if that's already been decided when in fact it seems like we've glazed over the option of remediating the current jail and bringing it back to a standard of care that would be considered constitutional and that would give uh, incarcerated individuals dignity, which is currently obviously not happening. So I would caution against rushing down the pathway of building a new capacity for the state to continue the same pattern of abuse and mistreatment when in fact we haven't addressed the problem at its core and we're just trying to pick the easiest solution perhaps. Um, so I would encourage you all to roll it back and please give us an explanation for why New Jail was proposed in the first place, why the remediation efforts have been all but abandoned, and uh, just more explanation of what is going into the process here would be greatly appreciated because I can tell you a lot of the people here are hurting f for the people on the other side of those walls in the jail who are having their rights deprived, and we don't want to see that being expanded. And I think that's a humane ask. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Next up is uh, City Clerk Nicole Bolden. So good afternoon. My name is Nicole Bolden and I am here in my capacity as the president of the Monroe County Black Democratic Caucus, not in my role as city clerk. But to continue, over the last few months, our organization has watched these proceedings with increasing dismay and frustration. The reason for this frustration has been rooted in the particular treatment of Counselor Jennifer Crossley and Sheriff Ruben Marte. 
while all of the elected officials in this room have been, from time to time, treated in a manner that is less than ideal by their colleagues, Councillor Crossley and Sheriff Marte have been the direct recipients of a noticeably high number of sighs, eye rolls, muttered comments, direct disparagement, and cutoff statements. While I hope that it is not the intent of those engaging in this behavior to indicate any bias, the fact remains that the only two elected officials of color in this room have been treated to a high level of disrespect that does not track with the treatment of others in this room. We request that moving forward, you treat all of the officials in this room with the respect and shared humanity that we hope you are all capable of. And for those officials in this room who are not on the receiving end of poor behavior, we ask that you say something when you see it happening rather than remaining silent for the sake of keeping the peace or sticking to parliamentary procedure. Some of you have asked for our support in the past. The way to retain that support is to be an ally to your colleagues. You do not have to agree with their statements, but you do have to refuse to allow them to be treated with disrespect. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next up is uh, Debbie Fish with Hope for Prisoners Task Force of the UUCB. Less than three minutes, thank you. <laughs> okay. Jim uh, Shelton has his hand raised okay. online. Who, who does? J Jim Shelton. Okay, uh, let's have Mr. Shelton. Sorry, I didn't realize anyone was, thank you. Mr. Shelton, please go ahead. Good evening, Jim Shelton speaking on behalf of the Greater Bloomington Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we just wanted to say, representing the business community, that we certainly agree with Mr. Falk and your two consultants that we need a new jail and we need it as soon as it's practicable to get it. We also agree that it needs to be, uh, have the facilities, the room, the uh, amenities that you need to be able to work with the uh, inmates and get them prepared to never have to come back. And then we'd like to, so we urge you to continue to work toward that, but we would also like you to work toward coming up with programs that will reduce the need to put mentally ill people or addicted people in car into incarceration to start with. We encourage you to work with partners throughout the community such as Centerstone, the Indiana Recovery Alliance perhaps, Indiana University, uh, the IU Health System, uh, the City of Bloomington, and come up with programs and come up with funding for the programs, not just any facilities you may need, but the ongoing salaries that would be needed to work with these uh, folks. I've been a CASA for over 10 years. Every case I've ever had, the at least one of the parents was incarcerated because of addiction almost always for drugs, one case where it was alcohol. And when they have encountered good programs, not necessarily in the state of Indiana, but often here, they have uh, been able to recover and be reunited with their children. And when they didn't, I just had a child uh, adopted on last Wednesday uh, because the parents were not able to do so. So I encourage you please to work on both fronts equally and, uh, and thank you so much for your efforts toward that. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Shelton. Next up is Kaisa Goodman from the city of Bloomington. Good evening. Good evening, Kaisa Goodman, Public Engagement Director for the City of Bloomington and a Monroe County resident. Since I started my role as the Public Engagement Director in January, I've made public comment at every CJRC meeting, today being the fifth time. I and many others, including some members of this committee, have asked many times for the city, including the administration, the City Council, and the Bloomington Police Department to be brought to the table, along with other key stakeholders who have not been welcomed as full partners on this issue. The city's core message has been and remains 
that this conversation about the jail needs to be more holistic and focused on public health, prevention, diversion, wraparound services, comprehensive mental health and substance use disorder services, and immediate steps that can be taken to improve the conditions in the jail. To quote the mayor in his State of the City speech, quote, I challenge us in our highly over-incarcerated count county and state, country and state, imagine if for every new dollar we propose to invest in needed jail and jail-related services, we also invest a new dollar or more in prevention and pre- and post-incarceration services and facilities, end quote. At the meeting two weeks ago, I read into the record an excerpt from an email between the mayor and county attorney Jeff Cockle, where we offered to set up a meeting with county representatives to discuss the jail, including potential sites. Almost a month after the mayor's offer to meet about this and making clear that the door is wide open, we are aware of no meaningful response or progress. No meeting has been set up, no conversations have been suggested or held between the administration and county by any potential sites or any of the other priorities we've raised. Frankly, this mode of communication with city staff makes bi-weekly brief public comments without an opportunity for dialogue, combined with brief, infrequent, or no communication received from county staff on this issue, wholly fails to meet the moment and the complexity and nuance of justice reform. It is at best an inefficient and painfully slow process. Really, it's deeply problematic because our time is precious and we should be truly collaborating. The reality is that we need real ongoing dialogue about justice reform. The location and scale of a potential new jail, yes, and also public health, prevention, and diversion services and more. I believe that all of us here today want real reform, reform of our justice system and that we all despair at the conditions in which the people in our jail are living. I hope we all agree that immediate substantial investments in public health, including mental health and substance use interventions, are also needed and merited. I'm asking publicly, again, for city government to be engaged in earnest and to have a chance for real direct conversation with county leadership about the topics that have been raised and how best to approach them together. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Goodman. Renee Miller has her hand raised on Zoom. I'm sorry, who? I'm sorry. Renee Miller. Renee Miller, okay. Hello. <clears throat> I have two things I want to say before I act. I have two things I want to say before I go into my statement. One is the microaggressions have been obvious, and thank you to Ms. Bolden for pointing those out. Gosh, I wish I had pointed it out first. Um, but thank you so much, Ms. Bolden, for pointing those out. Uh, and secondly, um, I only spent a short time in jail, but I'm white and I have wealthy parents. Those without resources don't get so lucky, and I appreciate the lived experience shared, and thank you so much to the gentleman for sharing his. Now on to my comments. <clears throat> when surveying people, in Monroe County with lived experience for the Advisory on Public Safety Commission, our very first question was, please define what public safety means to you. And every single time, the answer was, public safety means to me housing, it means uh, I've lost my place. It means housing, having water, having food, and having loving connections. So I'm asking you as a, an advisory committee to please define what public safety means to you all because without making that definition, you can't really work on public safety. Um, I echo McColl's comment about making sure that the public is involved in subcommittee discussions and I'm troubled that the county will not reach back across the table to begin the hard work necessary and I think that we need to have people reaching across the table and so please start doing that. We do have um, properties available so thank you for your time and thank you for your hard work. I appreciate the time to be able to speak also. Thank you. Thank you. 
I would like to point out that today I was in touch with uh, Sheriff Marte about some of the surveys and we will be working together, I hope. I'm pretty sure we will. Uh, and we will be trying to get out the one to the local law enforcement through our offices so that we're not taking up your time, your precious time. Um, our legal counsel has been in touch with legal counsel within the city about land and locations, and it is our intention that for these subgroups that we're creating, to have them be public meetings and that we come back together on uh, a regular basis to see what progress we've made, to see where we need to integrate again, and to keep moving forward. But our intention, every intention, is to um, have these be public meetings, noticed meetings, so that we are working with, with people here. Um, I'd like to move on, because we've got a lot to cover tonight, so um, no one else. Just as a, excuse me, um, since it is only 4.57, um, and I see there is oh, a member of the public that's still Thank there. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I did not see that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ashley Pirani has her hand raised on Zoom. Thank you. Thank you. Ashley Pirani, Monroe County resident. Um, I will be brief in my remarks. One, I just wanted to uplift what um, Ms. Nicole Bolden had to say this afternoon regarding um, treating one another uh, with, res with respect that we certainly have not been seeing on the same level. Um, I really want to amplify that and I hope that everyone that is sitting there will please take that to heart. It's super important. Um, the second thing I'd like to do is I'd like to also bring up again, which I did last month, about the report that is supposed to come out about the visitor, the visit to Maricopa County from the three commissioners. We were told back in December that there would be a report to come out and I don't see that on the agenda still. And I'm wondering when we are going to see that as um, taxpayers, I think it's important that you share that with us because we helped pay for that trip. And if it's so important to this, then we need to hear about it. Thank you. Just uh, in response to that, um, we do have on our agenda for March 20th, um, an opportunity for everyone that's in this, on this committee to share what we've seen at various facilities. And we've, we've been prepared to talk about the three facilities um, we visited in Arizona is actually more than that, but the three basic um, areas, geographic areas we visited, um, Yavapay and Maricopa and Pima counties um, with different types of facilities that we've seen. Um, and we'll be um, talking about that on the 20th when, when it's on our schedule. So thank you. And, and since we're back on agenda item number four, uh, the tentative plan for upcoming meetings. I'd just like to renew my request that we add to the agenda a discussion about the facilities or departments that need to be co-located with the jail so we can get a sense of how much land is actually needed. Because as you were discussing, um, there's some conversations either potential with the city to make sure we're looking at the appropriate amount of land and not foreclosing some options that will have greater access to those in the community um, which I think is incredibly important as you're making decisions. So I was wondering if we put that on the agenda. We, it was my hope um, that as people work in their subcommittees, that people can come back to us and talk to us about what they feel should be co-located at the jail. And so I don't know without, when, I don't know what we need for treatment. I don't know what we need for release and, and re-entry. I don't know if those should be co-located, but I would like the people from the subgroups to come back with that information. I don't know how others around the table feel. Judge Stafford. I think this issue was addressed by the survey that the judicial branch did, and I think it was pretty clear that the judicial branch, including bailiffs, probation officers, judges, court staff, bailiffs, et cetera, all recommended co-location of probation, public defenders, prosecutors, courts, clerk, sheriff, and jail. And I think it was pretty clear, and certainly um, correct me if I'm wrong, that the prosecutor public defender practicing attorney, sur attorney survey also recommended the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I think we've already provided our input on that, and I don't know that it's changed in any way. Thank you. Commissioner yeah, and, I, and I would just add that once, um, once we've selected the 
design group to um, assist us with the facility process, that's going to be one of the things they're going to help us with is talking about how much land do you need. Um, and um, they're going to be the professionals um, to provide that input um, on top of what we've already learned, um, as Ms. Stafford noted, from the uh, surveys. So I think that's why both are, are going to be very important. Thank you. Okay, and sorry, just to follow up to make sure I understand, since there's going to be a decision sometime this week, most likely, about which of the three who responded are going to be moving forward, the designer, um, could we then, once that decision has been made, add to the agenda a discussion of what facilities should be included? I understand they're going to tell us how much space for each one of those departments, but if there's not a decision about which department there is going to be included, I, I think we could discuss that as a group. And this is, I think, particularly important as you're talking about a budget. If you ultimately decide not to co-locate certain of those services and inmates are being transported back and forth between a non-co-located jail and court, and for us who are downtown, that is going to incur significant, I think it will be significant costs. Um, so if you're making decisions based on a budget, it seems like it's a pretty important thing to decide now. And since we have so many representatives, it'd be helpful to discuss that, I think, as a, a whole committee, especially since you're already making decisions on some of those pieces. So could we consider that once you've made a decision? Would that be more appropriate to hold to the first quarterly meeting when we have feedback from all these on the different subgroups? I'm, I'm not saying no here, I'm, I'm really not. Um, I'm just trying to figure out when it would be most beneficial. Well, maybe it's a good time to move into subcommittees because I, I can share, I, I have some concerns about the subcommittees and I would ask that we remain as a whole committee and start putting some of these items on the agenda so we can start getting to work and make sure we're hearing from all of the voices at the table um, and making sure we're not creating obstacles to the participation of our community. Many of the things that you suggested on the list are gonna overlap, so right. I guess we can address that when we talk about subgroups, if that'd be more helpful. Um, at this point, we'd like to move forward on what's on the agenda, thank you, and share with you some of the, the visions that we, as the commissioners have, and I'm gonna start with Commissioner Thomas. Yeah, I'll just start out by saying that uh, we've heard from and we appreciate hearing from the public and uh, members of this committee um, and it's evident that the conversation needs to continue, um, but we, but we have yet to express um, our own uh, goals and our own vision. And um, and in in a nutshell, uh, our goal is to prevent and limit incidents of incarceration. For those who are incarcerated, we want a more humane facility, one that allows for programming and release reentry planning, uh, speedier judicial processing and treatment is key. Uh, mental health, substance use disorder treatment, um, physical treatment as well. If a person is incarcerated, we wanna reduce um, or prevent recidivism, uh, which does require a reform of the criminal justice process. Um, we do wanna provide programming and treatment and we want to ensure that transitional housing is available throughout the community to ensure reentry and success and to prevent recidivism. Um, we continue uh, to have questions raised. Uh, every question is important, but we have to remain focused on our goal, a speedy, not hasty, but efficient and effective development of a new facility. And it's important that we move forward and um, Ken Falk has reminded us of this. Um, Sheriff Marte has reminded us of this. Um, he was on the show on, on Friday and, and mentioned this. We need to move forward. That doesn't mean we don't continue to provide our role as landlord um, of the building. It doesn't mean that we, um, that we say, you know, no repairs, no whatever. It, it, it just means that we need to, to get planning and get moving um, in an expeditious, not hasty manner. Um, and there are a number of components, and I'm gonna start with some of the jail components that we've seen, that we've, we've done a lot of homework for years, um, a lot of tours, not just in Arizona, and um, we have a lot of aspects that we wanted to talk through. 
Um, but we'll start with the facility itself, the actual jail facility. We believe that with reduced recidivism, with a focus on treatment, uh, voluntary and involuntary, um, meaning that the community has access to treatment to prevent incarceration, intercept zero, and improvements in the criminal justice process, we envision a jail that can house um, the same number of people, and then over time, we believe fervently that there will be fewer people in the inmate population. That's our hope, our dream, our vision. Uh, we need to ensure that there is enough room for um, moving inmates from one area to another, enough for um, shifts in population, separate areas for transgender individuals, et cetera. We just need to make sure that we have appropriate space. Um, utilizing the best practices that we've learned from our tours of facilities around the country um, will help ensure speedy and effective and efficient processing, incarceration treatment and release programs uh, developed to ensure humane, thoughtful and compassionate service. We have seen some amazing innovations incorporated into the physical jail structure in terms of the flow down to the smallest detail of have a packed snack ready, have Gatorade ready um, when folks arrive because sometimes being hungry just makes things worse. Um, you know, so down to those little details to the much larger concerns about um, uh, flow and hallways and cell sizes and pass-through cells and things like that. Mar modern jails do require less staffing and we've seen modular jails used for maximum to minimum security and everything in between. Um, and that infrastructure will allow for um, an expansion for separate treatment wing, uh, for all of these great options, programming, education, uh, career, uh, everything you could think of. Um, with that infrastructure in place, we can really do some wonderful things. The things we are envisioning require a much larger jail footprint. It should be a single story with more recreation space. We'd like each pod to have its own recreation space, which will cut down on the need for staff to move people from their pod to the recreation area and also allows inmates more time there. We would also like to see more programming space, more meeting rooms, bigger day rooms, showers within the day rooms, staff observation rooms, a bigger sally port, possible garden space, a bigger kitchen for training and preparation of food for people in the jail, more medical space, and more intake space for those who are brought to the jail in crisis, drunk, or on illicit drugs. In Maricopa County, each of the pods had a separate program room medical room and attorney client room, meeting room. In Yavapai County, Arizona, the kitchen in the new facility was oversized so that it could be used during a community emergency to help feed people. We'd like to see office space for those doing the case management release planning, an exercise room for the jail staff, and a modern place to store inmate belongings. At the very least, we'd like to see expanded space for one-on-one -on -one client attorney meetings throughout the facility. As both Sheriff Marte and Kim Falk have said, we don't want an elevator in the facility. We would like to see two courtrooms, one for processing and another for hearings, natural lighting throughout, programming, treatment, both medical and for mental health, AA, NA, life skills, art, agriculture, food service training, and other sk job skill training. We also want there to be space for service providers to meet with inmates while they are incarcerated as a part of, of a discharge release program. Case management should begin with the arrival of an inmate tracking progress throughout the sentence to ensure that the inmate has access to programming, education, training, mental health SUD assistance, and to simultaneously plan for release. 
junk fees should be avoided. Phone calls, contact with family, access to tablets should be free for inmates. The cost of food and snacks should approximate the market outside of the facility. We envision a crisis center like the one we saw in Pima County, Arizona, with a no wrong door facility to accept voluntary and involuntary patients for a short, stabilizing stay of up to five days. This center should be available to adults and juveniles. It could be the first step in recovery, maybe with medically assisted, treat assisted treatment, or it may be the first step before transforming, transferring a patient to a residential med mental health or substance use disorder treatment facility. And it would also be used in conjunction with the Stride Center and 988 Mobile Crisis Services. We would like mental health and substance use disorder treatment to be available either as an annex to the jail or a wing in the jail facility. There are also alternative sentencing practices that could be explored. Transitional housing must be available throughout the community to foster a reduction in recidivism along with options for sober living. Transitional housing should be no cost or low cost to help releasees reintegrate into the community and allow them to save money to help establish their own permanent living situation. This would be an option as it is recognized not everyone will need housing. We feel that it's incumbent upon us to, to divide up into the sub, subgroups because we have different roles to play here. We're not going to tell the judicial how to operate things. That's not our role, that's not our expertise, that's not what we think that we ought to be doing. I'm not an expert in treatment. I think that we should be pulling in people who are experts in treatment. I'm not an expert in case management. So when we talk about release and reentry, we want to have these things happen so that we are reducing recidivism, so that we are making people, we're, we're putting them back into our community in a way that makes a difference. And so we wanted to take some time to talk about these committees, what the goal might be to start with, and um, wanted to assure people that we would expect to come back in quarterly meetings for the whole group. Um, so these are the, we're not trying to predetermine anything. We've got a blank board up here. And so we'd like to know, what do, you, what do you think should be in a facility? You've heard us talk about what we think should be there. What do you think should be there? Oh, Commissioner Githens. Yes. <coughs> Thank you, I really appreciate um, you sharing your statements because I think it gives us a good start to some of the, I heard a lot of things that we all agree on. Um, not everything, but there was a lot of really good, a good list for us of things that I think we could start putting on our agenda and start talking about as a group. Um, at this time, um, we're not in favor of these particular subcommittees, um, and so there's some concerns about that. Uh, first, I want to make sure that we're not creating obstacles to community participation, and I think having four subcommittees plus a main committee is going to be really challenging, I think, for everyone at this table, um, but also for committee members who have come in to learn more about the process and to understand what's going on and to make recommendations. And when the community is speaking to us, I'm listening and taking notes. And I think that one of the challenges we have with the justice system is, and that we're trying to overcome, is that we have information silos. We all work in our own areas, and um, if I wanna make different decisions, I need different information. And so I think we're all here in good faith to learn more information to make the system better. So if we want real justice reform, I think we need to start working collaboratively, putting these items on this agenda and start talking about them. Um, and let me just give an example of how I think that they overlap. Um, I made the suggestion or request that we put on our agenda release support. I'd like to focus on that first 72 hours in which someone is released from the jail. Um, there's a lot of things to look at at that first 72 hours. We're talking about connections to treatment, which is a different subcommittee, according to what we have right now. Um, 
you're released from jail for a lot of different reasons. It could have been at a bail review hearing, an initial hearing. It could have been as part of a disposition. So we might involve pretrial release or might be involving probation. So release support, I think, is a great example of how all of those things are intertwined. And if we start separating us out, we're not only creating barriers to participation, but we're reinforcing the information silos that currently exist. Um, treatment is another great example. I th it's wonderful talking about it. Uh, treatment, though, means a lot of things to me. We talk about treatment at initial hearings, at bail reviews, predisposition. We were talking about pretrial uh, pretrial conferences. Once someone has a probation violation, what type of treatment do they have access to? So, I just I worry that we create these subcommittees. And then what if a community member wants to make a recommendation or we want to make a recommendation, we might have to go to all four subcommittees and the main committee, and that just doesn't seem the most uh, efficient way or most holistic way to really approach some of the challenges that people are facing. Um, and then my last point, my last two points. You, you mentioned a facilities committee. Uh, the articles that you released recently, the requests for qualifications and their responses, at least two of them suggested within their own process that there would be collaboration with stakeholders regarding the facility. So it feels like a facility committee would be duplicative of that. Um, so maybe we should wait until we better understand what that process is going to look like. Um, and then lastly, just a thought about judicial processes. The judicial branch is a separate branch of government, so it seems like a subcommittee under the commissioners may not be the appropriate place for us to have that. Um, and with judicial processes, we're talking about case management, which means treatment, uh, release and reentry, and it also means facility. So it seems like that one is one we could uh, uh, move in a different direction and, and just start putting things on the agenda. Thank you. Commissioner Thomas. Um, yeah, so I, um, I hear what you're saying. You used um, the royal we, and I'm not sure um, uh, if you're referencing your department or um, when you say we. Which statement? At the beginning, you said we don't want to do subcommittees. We don't think subcommittees are a good idea. I, I, I said at this time, we're not in favor of. We, OK, who's we? I'm just trying to figure out who The we prosecutor's is. office okay. is not in favor Perfect. of okay. these particular subcommittees at this particular time. Okay. I think there could be a time and place for subcommittees but we want to make sure that we're uh, respecting voices, not creating obstacles, and that we are having collaborative conversations. Um, and that's, I think, going to be difficult if we're just spending time dividing us. So I'd, I'd like to work towards more collaboration. Right. OK. I, was just, I just wanted some clarity, and thank you for that. Um, so the, for example, the judicial process is, is in fact, outlined extensively, and, and um, Commissioner Githens has the list. It's out, outlined extensively in um, the jail study, um, the, the judicial processes that need to be addressed. We're not addressing that as a group because that's not the commission. This is not the commissioner's subcommittee. This would be a subcommittee of people involved in the judicial process. And we don't know that anything is happening in terms of reforming the judicial process in order to reduce the number of people um, in a jail facility. Um, and um, we don't have a role there, and we would not expect to be on a committee relating to that, right? That would be judges, prosecutor, public defender, um, whoever Private else. Attorneys, yes. Yeah. Um, and so, and in terms of the facility committee, we do have to. Um, meet with whichever group it is that um, we decide to make a contract with and we do need to start looking at um, properties and we do need to get um, some groundwork done um, as soon as possible um, and so that's that would be the facility committee now our hope is that indeed these processes will be as transparent as possible, um, that the uh, judicial process group would um, have public meetings, would invite public comment, um, and if that is somebody's interest and focus, that's great. If somebody has multiple areas of interest or focus, we should, we should have them at the quarterly, however often we meet, 
um, larger group meetings. And that's the whole point is to not silo. Yes, siloing temporarily, but we need to move forward on things because we could talk forever. But until, for example, we have a blueprint, a model, a something to talk about when we're talking about facilities, for example, we don't have anything to talk about until we have something to critique. And we need to get to that point where we have specific things on the table to talk through um, as a large group with the public. Um, and that's my initial, just my initial response. I hear what you're saying and I appreciate it. Thank you. And I do have a follow-up, but I see that Judge Stafford has her hand up, so I'll just go after her and then Mr. Iverson. I'm sorry. Were you in charge of the meeting? If you'd like my response now, I'm happy to. Well, I'm sorry. I don't I think just, we need that I, tone. I, 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 don't I don't think either, we need that tone. I don't need to the tone, but I also, I felt that's like not my okay. toes were being stepped on. I'm that's, also an elected official, and I feel like I was being disrespected here. I really I, did. I, I saw your wow. hand. I saw Judge Stafford's. I was about to call okay. on you. So it's. I just, okay. I, I just think yeah. that was a slight shade comment that if we don't have anything nice to say, we shouldn't say it at all. Judge Stafford. I certainly respect the commissioner's ability to appoint subcommittees, but if I had a vote, which I don't think we do on this advisory committee, or if Robert's rules applied, which we've been told that they don't, I would be voting against subcommittees right now for this reason. Um, a, I concur with Ms. Wilson's comments about wanting to make sure this process is very open to the public and very inclusive of everyone's input. I very much fear the siloing that would happen if we met in subcommittees, and especially if we did not come back as a full group more often than once a quarter. My personal vote would be that we start with the recommendations in the reports for the facility, the recommendations and the surveys that have already be done, been done, that that we spend one to two meetings focusing first on the facility, that next we spend one to two meetings focusing on treatment. I think these topics are excellent. I concur that we need to focus on them. I think we all agree we need to take action. But I would vote that we take that action and have those conversations together so that we can have the input from all here and from the public. So I would vote that we start with facility, cap it at two meetings, then spend two meetings on treatment, then two meetings on case management and re-release. I, I think maybe that can be combined with treatment, but I, that's not my area. I would venture to say, and I, I am not trying to throw shade by saying this, that if the Board of Judges had a committee on reforming the executive branch, and that if we appointed the commissioners to that committee, they would feel disrespected by that process. And I don't think it is appropriate to put judicial process on as a subcommittee of the commissioner's committee because we are a separate branch of government. We absolutely are discussing these things in our board of judges meetings. I would note that the uh, open door law in Indiana applies to the legislative and executive branches. It does not apply to the judicial branch. I'm not sure that we could meet in public meetings and discuss things for that reason. Some of those discussions do need to happen in private. With that said, I'm not trying to keep those discussions from being public, and I am not speaking for the Board of Judges when I say those things about having a subcommittee for the judges, but I am, I am very uncomfortable with the separation of powers problem that that presents. Thank you. Peter, Councillor Iverson, sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, you know, I'm fairly agnostic as to whether or not we split into subgroups or whether we do, uh, you know, off again, off again type of a, a, a situation that was just recommended. But I, I do think that the conversation about silos is germane here. And, and one of the things that I was looking forward to the treatment group or a treatment conversation, whichever way it goes, is getting the health department back in again. And in particular, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of really good work going on in the health assessment and improvement plan conversations uh, that's going on in the health department. I think that there's a lot of overlap between the vision that was just articulated the reports that were written and some of the conversations we've been having here and I think that those two conversations can dovetail really nicely so finding a way to do that 
I also think that subcommittees can be a nice vehicle to incorporate uh, the city of Bloomington's views, particularly the police department, mm -hmm. particularly the way we're thinking about climate change and how to be resilient and thinking about the way that a huge jail is going to be impacting uh, our, our response to climate change. And I think that there are probably other departments within the city that we, we could be hearing from in a subcommittee group or maybe even in a separate group that would be helpful. There's, there's also some information, I think, in the release and reentry that's happening in our community corrections that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, Miriam Northcutt Brummer from Indiana University is doing some work with Troy Hatfield on reducing revocations challenge. Uh, we've talked a lot about the sequential intercept model, and they just gave Monroe County a grant that allows the New Beginnings program to be in the jail again. I think that's a great way for us to be talking about how is this program working with the new leadership, and, and how can we uh, expand this in a new facility? Because uh, you know, I was listening to Noon Edition as well, and I heard agreement between commissioners and sheriff that we need more space for programming. Everyone wants more programming. We just can't put it anywhere. So again, I'm, I'm agnostic as to whether or not we split into subgroups or we go on, off again, on again. What I do feel strongly about is that we cannot stop meeting as a larger group if we split into subgroups. I, I think it's very important that number one, we have public comment, and number two, that we get the feedback from the larger group. I think that that needs to continue. Um, and I also, you know, there's, let, let me conclude by saying that treatment is such a broad topic. Mm -hmm. Even in the vision that you just articulated, there are dozens of programs that in the Eve Hill report, she recommends that weren't in your vision. That's not saying that your vision is deficient. I'm just saying it's a huge deal. So how do we wrap our heads around treatment in a way that's comprehensive, but making sure that everyone's at the table? Because we don't have the experts at the table right now, and we need to have the experts at the table. Um, Judge Fawcett, and then I'd like to say something also. Yeah, okay. Ms. Cross, I had it. Okay, I didn't see that. Thank you. Um, so I have a, a lot of questions. Um, one, I guess, as it's been echoed so many times around here, is that I don't think that we can stop meeting because I was so quarterly after April 3rd is what I'm hearing because it was said that we're going quarterly. Um, so I, I, I think I have questions about that. Um, two, again, I will keep beating the drum of, I do think that if we are to break up into subgroups, and I, and I have a point about that here in a second, that I do think you can operate the subgroups in ways that other various boards and commissions um, meetings work, where people actually pay attention and public still can come um, and public can still um, have a spot for those where they can feel like they're being heard. Because I will say, I am so thankful for the public um, because ever since I've been on here, my views of things have changed in ways and I've been influenced by members of the public. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm no expert at all means. Um, and, and I'm not this five foot person that just doesn't care to listen to anybody, but I care because as we have public comment that comes through, I listen to everybody, I take it in, I reflect on that, and it makes me wonder how we could be all doing better. The whole vision, transparency, all of that things. So I'd, I'd, I still say that if we are to split up um, into subgroups, that I do think that we continue to meet publicly um, so that folks can still pay attention to what it is that we're doing, and then um, we can convene however we're, we're gonna do it. Um, secondly, I guess, I'm assuming those are the subcommittees and is that set in stone? Because if that is, then that's the part where I bring it back to the committee, then what is the point of this committee if that's already done and you have experts of the board of judges, public defenders, sheriff office, commissioners, county council, prosecutor's office, um, we, I thought that was the goal of this committee, is to try to have the influence in a way that we can have a conversation, that we can discuss what we think is best for subcommittees and go from there. Um, 
My other thing that I think it was brought up in, in somebody's comment up there, I guess if work isn't being done by the judicial branches, like whatever the case is, then I guess, and if you're at the table, I guess I would ask the question what it is that you're doing um, to reduce the things because while I appreciate we finally hear in the vision of the commissioners, to me personally, it doesn't feel like it's hindsight 2020 because it's excluding some of our voices and some of our vision as well. And if this is a subcommittee or if this is a committee that is under the umbrella of the commissioners, I would assume, um, and maybe I'm making too many assumptions, is that we really want to see the clearer vision of all of us and try to listen to all of us. And I think the way that we do that is that we figure out if that is all of the subgroups, can we talk about that? Um, I know Ms. Wilson has been asking for since January, um, at least January since I've, like can we have certain things on agendas um, and then to hear in the March 6th that this is gonna be a topic of subcommittee. So I think that's where the underlying thing is, for me, is how can you have a vision without the rest of us here in this committee? Um, I, I appreciate hearing that. I don't necessarily think that it's a bad idea to go into subgroups. I do think that we need to do some work first as a whole before we break up to subgroups, but before we do that, the whole thing this entire time that I've been preaching and that other folks at this table have been preaching is we have to hear each other out. We have to listen. As I sit here and listen to you all talk about your vision, one of the things that I wrote down is, isn't that something that I would assume, I would hope that Sheriff Marte is the custodial of the jail and that commissioners and your vision of you know more space, more space, all of these different things, I would think, you and you would band together and have a conversation about that and then maybe we can talk about that as a whole but it seems to be there's a pocket over here there's a pocket over here there's a pocket over here and no there's no can there's no joining of forces and that's where this vision is very blurry for me because I don't feel like we all are fitting in and mirroring the vision that the Board of Commissioners have. That's my personal take. Thank you. Judge, Judge Fawcett. So my thoughts have been a little scattered after I'm trying to listen to what everybody is saying. And I, I agree with Ms. Crossley in that I, I was happy to hear some direction from the commissioners as to what ultimately your vision is, because as you've told us so many times before, and it's just the matter of reality that you are the ones who are ultimately going to be responsible for deciding what goes into the jail, how it's going to get funded, how many beds, where it's located, and the size. Um, where I'm getting, and I think a lot of people are getting frustrated, and most importantly, the people sitting in the jail are the most impacted and beyond frustrated is we have given input after input after input. Thousands of dollars, I can only imagine, have been spent on surveys um, that were needed, on trips that were needed. A and it's like we're asking the same question and just wanting to hear a different answer. And, and that is where I just don't understand why since the first day I sat on this committee, I thought, well, give me some parameters. Then I can tell you what my experience thinks is best. Um, and then you either listen to it and agree with it or you, you take it another direction. And that's what I would just implore this committee to start to do is we can listen to each other, which I'm not so sure that's happening, but then at the end of the day, decisions have got to start to be made. They just have to be made. And I would be remiss if I skip over the comment about the judicial process and not quite sure what's going on there because come and watch as you've been invited to. 
Um, we've got the pretrial release. There are release to treatments time and time and time again. There right. are the problem solving court. And Mr. Falk and the sheriff has said to you, if not for the, the judges have helped to reduce the jail population. Now I'm not saying there are not ways that the judicial process can be improved without a doubt, but I find it interesting of all the things that we're looking at in that report, and following is the fact that this report is saying the judicial and the judges need to move faster. But many of the recommendations that they put in that report are beyond our control. They're recommending we use programs that we can't use. They're recommending that we follow a process that we don't follow here in Indiana, that we can't follow under the Constitution in Indiana. So it's a little, I would say, again, not to say that the judicial process cannot be improved upon, but, um, that's a hard one to swallow and to say that, that this one little facet has to be a focus of the subcommittee because there is, this problem is not a result of one individual, any group. It, it is the overall criminal justice system. It's the lack of affordable housing. It's the, the lack of jobs, the lack of education. And, and unfortunately for us and for me, the judicial system, it's reactionary. It's not a problem until it's in front of me. And this is where I wish we could do some true criminal justice reform to prevent them from getting into here. But that does no good for the people who are sitting upstairs in the jail that does not meet constitutional sta standards. And we have all been on notice. And I am the one who is forced with the decision of having to decide whether or not I put somebody into the jail. And we, we have just plain and simply got to move on this. One of the reasons that, and I went back through Mr. The, the report that we had, um, and one of the reasons I, I talked with others about these kinds of breakdowns is that we can immediately start to look at treatment options to help people to keep them out of the system. We can immediately look at treatment options as they exit, what, whatever, whenever they exit the system. We can start to look at reentry, and I'm glad to hear that programming is going back into the, the, our facility to help with that. But we could be doing some of the reentry outside. And I was trying to pick up things that we could do today and start to make a difference on to actually reform our criminal justice system. We know that we're a few years out from a new jail. We don't have to be a few years out on these other components. And that was my hope to get to, to where those, those kinds of things are. I think Sheriff Marte wanted to say something. It's really quick, but keep in mind what Attorney Falk, what he said, he said, don't, don't sacrifice good for perfect. And we have to make a decision. You know, I, I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm, I'm observing this and I have no problem reaching out to Cross the Isle and working with you in any capacity that I can. But right now, the present time, right now, that jail is deteriorating at a fast rate. We gotta find a location and we gotta start. Because even if you broke ground today, yep. it's going to be years. Yep. Yep. That, that roof, commissioners, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you've seen it yet. I invite you to come see it. I was there a couple of days ago Friday. It's getting tremendously worse. Attorney Falk said bad things can happen, and I'm repeating it myself. Until you come and see with your own eyes, I don't think you fully understand the ratification of what I'm saying to you. It's going to be very serious. P please act. Act now. Start the process. Don't sacrifice good for perfect. Don't do that. Thank you. I don't know Amen. which of the two of you had were first. I support and share the sheriff's comments. I would let you know that we had another leak just this past week. Um, entering into the building, they had to change the entrance to the building because I think it was leaking through the cement actually, and the and then I think it leaked into courtroom 313, which is where we have our jury trial. So it's affecting as well um, inside. Separate of that, though, I hear a couple things that I want to follow up on. Um, Commissioner Thomas, you said that you wanted to understand what's going on in the judicial processes, I think that, or Commissioner Gethins. Well, um, someone else has said that, but we are the subcommittee. If, if you have questions about what's going on in the judicial processes, which for me is a big word, I hear case management, feel free to ask us. 
ask us what's going on or some of the struggles we're having. Because um, I can tell you, there's a list of things I'd like to share with you of things we could put on the agenda now that would impact things now that we could work together on now that impacts the inmates who are living in those conditions now that we're trying to move forward on. Our struggle hasn't been a list of topics. Our struggle is we can't get anything on the agenda. And that makes it difficult to even have a conversation. So I think one thing we could do, because we all agree we need to take action now, is we could start picking two things one, to address the immediate concerns of the jail, as shared by the sheriff, and that if we could talk about the, how much land we need so we can start working towards that as a committee, that would be something that would work on that right now to start moving that process. And then I would ask that we put one item on the agenda, specifically release support, or I'm open to other options, where we start working on helping people now. And as a committee, and we invite people to the table, instead of spending more time trying to figure out how to divide us and hope that we eventually all get the same information, which is not going to necessarily happen. Judge Stafford. I believe it was October when I made the suggestion that we start with the health department being in charge of a request for proposals from our community of nonprofits and medical providers to come in and provide treatment starting now whether that is community engagement by people who are not there to give mental health treatment, such as women writing for a change coming in, a local knitting group coming in, a local gardening group coming in, or whether it is actual mental health treatment coming in. But we could start in October last year with the health department, and I, I can't speak to why they were removed from the committee, of course, because that wasn't up to me. But my, my vote, if I had one, would be to bring them back and to have them start a process of requesting proposals for treatment at least to get something started. I would like to see um, that RRFQ be managed by the health department because at least they have more expertise in this area than I believe anyone here on the committee, certainly more than I do. I would also like to request that they do things like set SMART goals, specific, measurable, achievement, time-limited, efficient goals that will allow us to get feedback, such as if there are social workers, as I understand it now in the jail, helping people with exit planning, what are the goals that they're setting with people? How are we following up with them? We don't have some of that information, and I think that might be helpful. I would also like to suggest that um, I think that we need to decide, um, we need to pick the tail over the, I'm sorry, we need to pick the dog first and not the tail first. I said that backwards, my apologies. Um, and I think the dog here is how many beds? And I, I think it's pretty clear that decision is up to the, co the commissioners. I'm not trying in any way to tell you how to do your job or make a, make a recommendation there. I will say that um, I think the report recommended 488 beds. I think the prosecutor public defender survey was centered around 400 with a wide range. The judicial branch survey was around 350 beds. I can't say where to make that call. I think that's up to the commissioners. And I think the commissioners then will have to figure it out if, if the judges send person number 301 how that works, um, that, that's not up to us. But I will say that I think we need to decide how much space we need before we decide where it goes. The where it goes is the tail and the how many beds is the dog. Um, I did a lot of research and a lot of work with Dave Garner, our facilities manager, and with other members of this committee to come up with a spreadsheet of where we are in terms of current square footage. And by my calculations, if we had a jail that was a single story with sheriff offices, and if we had a three to four story building for courts and clerks, and a three to four story building for probation, public defenders, and prosecutor, prosecutor staff, that would allow us to combine conference room space, bathrooms, et cetera, to be as efficient as possible. If we add in an acre for green space and an acre for um, parking, that would all be nine acres or less, and that would easily fit downtown in one of two or three different locations. I think that for Monroe County, one of our goals is to demonstrate our progressive values and to live those values. And for me, that means inmates should not be hidden away in some corner of the county where they are not able to see family and friends and where they are not able to access services after their release. And to me, a location needs to be that when they're released, they can walk to Centerstone, they can walk to sober living houses, they can walk to the community kitchen and they can walk to Shalom or Friends Place. And I, to me, that's where I'm gonna live my progressive values is in pushing for that. So thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Can I ask one question about some of your calculations? And I'm not trying to be confrontational here at all, but uh, some of the facilities that we saw in Indiana as well had a lot more recreation space than what we have right now. They had a lot bigger uh, day rooms than what we have right now. They had more uh, medical space. Did you take all that into account, or what? how did you do? The calculations that I did were based on current space plus a factor of 30% for the court, clerk, public defender, and prosecutor. The calculations that I did for the jail were less exact because I don't know how many beds you all are recommending and how many beds you're going to vote on. If you tell me that, I will go back to my architecture mini-CAD program and give you more <laughs> specifics. But I'm somewhere between our current 126 beds, which has been double bunked for almost as long as the jail has been in existence, and the 488 recommended by the consultants you all hired. So if you give me something more exact, I can give you something more exact. I would be happy to, and I would say that I think everyone here on the, the committee and most of the members of the public that I have heard speak are in favor of things like larger day rooms, more meeting areas, and more recreation space. I remember a great conversation about gardening space at one of my first meetings, and I think mm -hmm. we were all thrilled about it. But I, you know, I'm going to need some specifics before I can draw you a better plan. Yeah, I, th I think we're going to be relying on um, whoever we hire um, to um, assist us with all of that. I mean, it's great that, that well, there's and, and a lot of thought that goes into all of this. Um, and, but, but, you know, for, for us, um, one of our concerns is to ensure that every aspect of the report um, that was done a few years ago now is, is getting addressed. It's more, it's about more than finding a location and building a building. There's a lot more, and, and I know Commissioner Githens took that report apart recently again. Um, I probably, we could probably all recite it by heart, parts of it. Um, I've read it so much, but um, it's not, it's, it's important that we all take our role and not spin our wheels. And, um, and that's a fine line. I think that's a real fine line. But I, um, I know that we are very eager, as Sheriff Marte knows, we're very eager to move forward <laughs> with getting this resolved as quickly as possible. Um, while we try to, you know, keep bailing out the sinking ship that is our current jail facility building, et cetera. Um, and so I think, um, you know, my focus is going to be on, on the facility side personally at this point, um, just because I feel like that's, that's our job. We have to make tough decisions. We're going to have to, to, to look at properties and see what's out there. And we're going to have to talk to whoever it is that we hire, who's going to help us determine how much space do you need? Look at the things we look at the components. We know what components we want. We've heard from you all about the components. We've, um, um, got a really good list from all of the public comment of the components that are required. Um, but we don't have that professional hired yet, and um, that's their job to help us determine space, um, location, size, et cetera. So. From, from a, a fiscal side of things, I really appreciate the work that Judge Stafford did because it gives us another data point, right? So, so in some of the, um, the co previous conversations and in, in what some of the uh, RFQ folks have given us, it's been you know, 25 acres or what have you. Now we have another data point that says nine acres. And you know, at the end of the day, Councilmember Crossley and I are gonna be approving the funds for whatever we're building. And if we're making a decision between paying for a nine acre facility or 25 acre facility, I kinda wanna know like, what are what's going into that right so what's going into that 25 acres it's so special that bumps it up that additional amount and i think one of the benefits from what judge davert has done is it's given us a, a lens on which to view uh what we're what we're heading towards i i, I really appreciate what she's done did, did you go ahead what what information are you guys looking for before you can, I guess, start to solidify some of the decisions? Like, like 
what, what goes into how many beds you foresee or how many acres you think you need? Since ultimately, as you all know, you're the ones who have to make those hard decisions. So like, I think that's what we're all spinning the wheels from and just trying to get more clarification. So what is it that you think, what, what's going into those decisions and why aren't we making more of them? It sounds like we are gonna have to do some real head scratching together on the number of beds. Um, sure, 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 please. I think that um, I'm gonna steal a comparison from my friend Judge Fawcett here about remodeling projects. I don't think we want to ask our general contractor how big we should build our kitchen because they're gonna say, you're gonna need all granite this and all stainless steel this, and you're gonna need it to be 500 square feet. Well, maybe I can cook pretty well in 200 square feet, and I don't care if it's formica or granite. And I want to have honest, let me be clear, I'm a judge, I am not an architect. I play one on TV, but I am not an architect. And while I may have a lot of fun with plans, and I've got a great little program here that I have spent way too many hours on, um, I get that the architects are going to need to do all of that work from, the, from scratch and that my plans are not the plans. Let me be perfectly clear. I get that, 100%. But I think the more we know what we want, the less we leave up to the decision of the person who gets paid more if we build more. And that is not to denigrate architects. That is something that applies to any professional, including lawyers. I think we need to decide if we want a Pinto or a Buick or a Cadillac and what that means to us before we hire somebody to build us a car. Did you? Oh. Ms. Wilson, or, sorry, I, don't, I didn't see who was first. Okay. 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 Um, and I, appre I do really appreciate the commissioners sharing their vision because I do think that you shared a lot of things tonight that we all can agree on. And maybe if we started with that list, we could start with a list of things we agree on, then work from there. Um, I appreciate you sharing that vision, but I, I, I do think another piece of it is it'd be helpful, I think, to all of us to hear some important questions that the county council would like answered or that they're curious about as they're making their difficult decision, and that's the funding question. So it, it seems that they might have questions that they're pondering as they're making their decision, and maybe if we approached it also from everyone's vision, that might be helpful in giving us a list of things to work on. Thank you. Councillor Crosley? So I guess the question is, now what? Now we're towards the end of, almost at the end of this meeting, and it, I'm just listening to my fellow committee members here. Um, it doesn't feel like we all are on the same page, if I dare say that. Um, but, so I guess, what now? So now that you've, you've shared your vision with us, and now there has been a discussion today about us, me in particular, um, maybe not seeing the perfect vision, so to speak, I guess, the point is how can we take what your vision is versus what we've all said here and how can we collaborate together to figure out our next steps? Because I would recommend that we go back to the drawing board for the subgroups um, and then we, we really sit down and talk about things um, in terms of like this conversation that we're, we're having I just don't want us to just blow hot air into the wind. How can, and again, that's what it seems to feel as though when you share your vision and then it's now, now what? So now I guess my question to you all would be, so then what do we do now? For the March 20th and the April 3rd, are we about to break up into subgroups? Can we talk about if this is the general consensus of the group, if this is, what we're supposed to go by, like what, what's, what's next? Well, my hope for, for 
adding these or subgroups was that we would bring in other voices. You know, we we don't have people that can talk to us in our own group about traumatic brain injury. We don't have people in our group that talk about substance use disorders and treatments. We I wanted us to bring other people in the community into these subgroups to give us that expertise. We also are not limited in, in we could be having liaisons between the different groups as well. Um, there's nothing from what I'm hearing, and I, I wanna talk with my colleagues about some of this, but um, there shouldn't be anything that would prevent us from having some of these subgroups while also maintaining the big group then. But I, I would like to check with others on that. Um, because I think that we have to move forward on some of these things today. We don't need to wait for that new facility to be talking about treatment. Um, I wanted to, to end this evening and, and share with you all something. Um, I know Councillor Iverson knows about this, but last week um, the health department took the lead and we applied for additional money through the a special opioid grant fund that the state is putting out. And we asked for additional people to be working at the Stride Center. We asked for a small vehicle for the Stride Center to use so that they can transport people home from either the jail or from hospital or from two appointments, you know, whatever they, they need. They ask for additional people for Centerstone to serve as liaisons. One of them would be with the jail so that if somebody enters the jail, somebody, can somebody from Centerstone can follow up on what medications they're using, make sure that if they don't get exactly the same medicine, it's the right substitute, and then be ready to help when they're ready to exit from the facility too. So that, that was one component. Other components are for harm reduction and to help hopefully reduce people that might enter the system because of the current drug laws. Um, I'm not in favor of some of the, <laughs> the drug laws that we have, but I also don't get to make a choice on that. Um, but we basically have asked for an additional $1 million from the state to help fight some of the things that are going on. And I think that, that if, if that's available, that speaks to some of the, the treatment, it speaks to some of the release things that we need to be working on, it speaks to uh, additional Narcan in our, our, our community and all kinds of things. So there are other things going on that I think would, would fit into some of these subgroups, um, but I don't know. I would like to hear my colleagues and their views. Commissioner Thomas? I, I would rather mull this over for a bit. I, um, I, I don't want to um, respond right now. I think, I think we should um, have some discussion and, and think about efficiency and efficacy um, and address and address all of this at one time, and and uh, but I I'm hope it, I'm hopeful that we'll stay on our schedule, and that our at our next meeting, we'll be talking through what we've seen at other facilities, um, all of us, because um, we've all gone to different places, and we should be sharing what we liked and didn't like um, in all of those different places, so we can all learn as much as possible. Thank you. Okay, uh, it's 5.58, I'd like to wrap up with Judge Stafford, if that's I'll possible. I'll be very quick. Um, I would like to propose that at least for right now, we put facilities on the agenda for the 20th and the 3rd to get started on our conversation. That would allow us to perhaps see if we could pull out the things that were recommended about facilities from the reports and from the surveys that were already done, take that as a starting space, maybe distribute it as a poll for ourselves and for the public to check yes include or no don't include and then we have a place to go in some direction for a subcommittee if subcommittees end up being the direction that the commissioners want to go. I think that it would be difficult for any one of these subcommittees if again you do want to do the subcommittees to start with just that and I think if we can talk about each topic first as a group and give them some direction and a mandate to have more conversations and keep meeting as a, a full CJRC in the interim, that alleviates a lot of my concerns about subgroups. I would still rather do it all as a group and hear from people as a group, members of the community, mental health professionals, the city, et cetera. But that's, again, just my two cents. Thank you. Okay. It's six o'clock. Um, I really hope that we can adjourn at this point, but it does sound like we all have a lot to think about. And I appreciate everybody's honesty and openness tonight. This um, felt 
Thanks for your time, everyone. Appreciate yes. it. Yes.